Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome on this second Sunday of Lent. Welcome to those of you worshiping in person, as well as those of you who are worshiping online. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, to help greet each other, could I ask everyone who is in the sanctuary now to turn and look at the clock back there, and there's a camera right near there, and just wave at all your friends online. It's great to see you. Okay, and later, later in our worship service, during the passing of the peace, we're going to have another opportunity to welcome those of you worshiping online by projecting your images onto the front screen, just a word of warning for those of you who are like drinking coffee and eating or whatever you're doing. <laughs> um, so I'd also like to welcome any visitors we have today. If you're a first time guest, please feel free to pick up one of the welcome bags before you leave. They're on a table in the Narthex area just outside the sanctuary. And now, drum roll please, I would like to give a very warm welcome to our pastor nominee. Uh, Reverend Kelly Spencer. So your pastor nominating committee sent out an email uh, a little over a week ago giving some introductory information about Pastor Kelly. If you didn't receive the information or want a chance to review it, I think we have a few paper copies of it out on a table uh, just outside the sanctuary doors. And those of us who interviewed and selected Pastor Kelly are very enthusiastic about what an outstanding pastor she would be for our church, and I hope that you will share our enthusiasm. So welcome to Newport, Kelly. Mm -hmm. I wanna share three important announcements. Number one, uh, session has scheduled a special congregational meeting today immediately following worship, I think most of you know this, for the purpose of calling a new pastor head of staff. And we encourage all members to stay for that meeting, whether you're worshiping in the sanctuary or if you're worshiping online. We'll be voting by using a show of hands, literally hands, not just the, uh, the ones that you have on Zoom, but your real hand. Um, and want to make sure that, uh, for those of you online, once the congregational meeting starts, that you just turn on your video so that we'll be able to see your raised hand and make sure to count your vote. And secondly, our new director of Children, Youth, and Family, Austin Rabine, will start work tomorrow. And she has a Master's of Divinity degree and will be working part-time at Newport with our youth and then she's going to continue working part-time at Redmond Presbyterian Church where she is youth director there. And she loves writing, deep discussions, building relationships, time outside, and games. And she's looking forward to getting to know the children, students, and young families at Newport. Also, coffee hour today will be in the Great Hall, not in the atrium. And we, even, we also have some tables where people can sit down if they'd like. And I hear there's some goodies, but I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I'd like to ask everyone in the sanctuary to sign the friendship pad. And um, starting with those who are closest to the center aisle where they're located. So thank you. Good morning. Please join me um, and answer responsibly to our call to worship. Here at the outer limits of Lent, we are called to walk with the neighbors and hedges which are us to the soul, to the workplaces which weary us, to the people who confuse us, to the faith which threatens us. Here at the corner of steadfast love and faithfulness, Here, where time is fulfilled, where God's kingdom is near to us as our neighbor.
people of God who feel they can stand and sing uh, to uh, stand and sing this wonderful uh, hymn by Marty Haugen, uh, Healer of Our Every Ill. <laughs> Before I went, continue with our service, I just wanted to welcome <laughs> the, the Reverend um, Eliana Maxim, uh, who is going to be doing our um, communion service today. So. Please join me in our prayer for brokenness. Light of heaven, may we seek you and find you. May we knock and the door be opened for we are sojourners looking for your kingdom. As we encounter suffering in this world, turn our hearts, our ears, our eyes, our souls toward Christ, who emptied himself and was tempted and suffered for us, even giving his own life. Plant seeds of hope and let us never stray so far into despair that we forget the resurrection of Christ and the power of his spirit. Amen. Here is a word of grace. The wideness of God's mercy, the range of God's forgiveness, the infinite love of God, the heart of hope which is never empty, all these gifts are ours as God restores us to the fullness of life meant for us. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
while they are coming up to the lectern. I'm going to ask everyone to think about a time when you were chosen for a team. <coughs> Do you remember a time when you were chosen for a team? Yes. So you're on a team for soccer, aren't you? Yeah. You used to play soccer. Okay. Any sports? We used to play soccer, but also we got other medical things such as fighting, um, judo, skate, step pad, hockey, box, those kinds of things. Yeah. So teams, right? And sometimes teams work together and sometimes teams compete. Um, but I want you to think about a time when maybe you weren't chosen first. And I don't know about you guys, but that was pretty much me all the time. People watched the way I walked and the way I stood and thought, no way. And so when I was growing up, I was almost always chosen last, unless one of my brothers was one of the team captains and then they chose me like second to last so I didn't feel so bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and I know that sometimes now coaches and PE teachers and drama directors and things like that, even classroom teachers, you know, when we divide students up, we'll say, all right, let's number off one, two, one, two, one, two, all the ones here and all the twos there. And that's pretty good, right? Because then nobody's last. There are the ones who always think they're better. And then there are the number twos who aren't number one. But I think that's better because at least that way nobody's chosen last, right? Well, when I was reading the scripture today, or today and earlier in the week, I thought a little bit of the scripture is about God choosing teams. And once I realized, I thought, uh, oh, because, you know, I'm always chosen last. But then I thought, God wouldn't do that. God doesn't want any one of us to feel last. And so it's not like, here's God's team and here's the other team and I'm last. And it's not even one, two, one, two. It's one, 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 because God wants us all only on his team. And the really cool thing is, God wanted us on his team even before he created the world. Before the world was created, God knew there was going to be a team, and it was going to be God's team, and we were all chosen first. And I tell you what, it makes me kind of forget about the times I wasn't, because being on God's team first is the best feeling of all. Will you stand and pass the peace with me, please? Ready? You gonna be tall? Okay. You gonna be tall too? Okay. Ready? We're gonna hold our hands out and we're gonna say, The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Will you please share God's love with one another? being disciplined. This is energy. <laughs> Thank you.
the piece just goes on and on and on. That's just a wonderful thing. It really is. I, I feel like I'm breaking it up with one of Chris Vincent's uh, great background stories. Uh, the next uh, piece the choir will sing for you today is really different. Uh, it is, comes from the Renaissance era from Italy. The composer, Salomone Rossi, uh, who is actually, his real name is Shlomo de Rossi, uh, lived in Mantua in Italy from 17, 1570 to 1630. He was Jewish, and he lived in the, the Jewish ghetto in that city, many of the Italian cities. Uh, 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 asked their Jewish people to live together in these places called ghetto. That is an Italian word. And so he lived there, but he thrived. He was very popular. Unlike many of his um, uh, other Jewish folk who could not go in and out of the ghetto uh, freely, he was offered the chance to do that because he was such a sought after music teacher, composer. Um, he performed in all of the uh, uh, places of worship and uh, uh, big elite houses. His sister was an opera singer who toured Europe. Her, her professional name was Madame Europa. Uh, and so he thrived and he wrote music uh, in uh, Italian, Latin, and Hebrew. And so his music was used both for Christian and Jewish worship. Uh, unfortunately, in 1630, the armies uh, from the north invaded this uh, uh, part of Italy and took over and decimated the ghetto. He either lost his life in that event or a plague that uh, struck very soon after. Um, this piece called Barechu is in Hebrew and it translates as, praise the Lord who is to be praised. Praised is the Lord who is to be praised forever and ever. And this piece is often a call to worship, uh, even today, uh, these words, I'm sorry, are often a call to worship in uh, 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 Jewish temples. So this is Baraku. Wow, I have to pause and say that was absolutely beautiful. Here is our prayer of illumination. God of extravagant grace, may your spirit refresh our hearts through the reading of the scriptures that we may perceive all the good we can do for Christ and so go forth and, grow, and so grow in our faith. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Friends, it is a joy to be here with all of you today, and I'm excited to read from the first chapter of Ephesians, starting in verse 3, going through verse 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. 
He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I recently got a Facebook message from an old neighbor of mine from childhood. She's the mom of three who helped me break into the babysitting scene all those years ago. So her message was both a surprise and a joy. She was reaching out to me because she had a friend who had been told her whole life that God hates her because she's queer. And now B, as we'll call her here, is trying to understand if God is real and if God could actually love her. My neighbor continued, I thought about you and your wife Katie and how much love and beauty I see in your life together. And I wanted to see if you'd be open for me connecting her to you. So once the group message was sent and introductions were made, B didn't waste any time. So you're telling me God doesn't hate me. Eight times. Eight times in the matter of minutes, but God can't really love me, right? The pastor in me loves these moments. Being able to tell B directly, God loves you without hesitation and without condition, this is what it's all about. Proclaiming truth and love, especially for those who have been left out for so long. It's an extra bonus that the pressure is kind of off of me in those situations, since God's the one that's doing the work and I'm just here. But the human part of me really struggles in those moments. I am great at telling others that they are loved and they are forgiven. And yet the second I mess up, the second I fall short, the second I'm less than perfect, I tend to forget that that truth applies to me too. Perhaps I'm not the only one. We all stand in the trenches of self-doubt, uncertainty, and fear in our own ways. However, the pastor and the person, the believer and the skeptic are brought together in this season of Lent. We are brought together in this season of Lent. We don't have to have all the answers and we don't have to stay strictly on the sunny side of life. It's a time specifically set apart for reflection and preparation. It's a time where we're allowed to have all of our emotions. We specifically don't have all the pieces to the puzzle yet. And so we wait for six weeks. And as we pause, as we give up spiritual distractions or take on spiritual disciplines for these 40 days, 
the truth of our faith remains the same. The author of all creation has chosen us. Chosen us to tell the truth. Chosen us to see visions. Chosen us to dream dreams. Chosen us to advocate for the marginalized. Chosen us to release the prisoners. Chosen us to feed the hungry. Chosen us to have the difficult conversations. Chosen us to love our enemies as well as our friends. For this Holy Spirit we have been gifted is not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love. And the author of Ephesians won't let us forget the center of our belonging here, Christ. Verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 11, and 13 all remind us that this powerful gift of chosenness is accomplished in Christ, through Christ, because of Christ. One commentator highlights God's greater mission that's seen through this passage. The mystery of God's will is to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. God's plan is to sum all things up, draw everything together in conclusion in Christ. Everything that has been separated out, divided, ostracized, and others will be gathered back together again because of who Christ is and just how much he loves us. The all things here is all-inclusive. This Pauline letter to the church in Ephesus kindly emphasizes for us that all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. There are no qualifications or requirements listed here. This Spirit of God, this Spirit of adoption, is freedom and belonging, not fear and good luck out there. Commentator Crystal Hall describes it powerfully as children of God, freed and forgiven. God's spirit reminds us of who we are when we're fearful, when we're suffering, when we think we're not enough. God's spirit reminds us that God made us in their image. We are beloved as God's children, and there is nothing we can do about it. Friends, adoption means that God has chosen us, taken us on, assumed responsibility for us. This adoption word is special, only shows up five times in the Holy Scriptures three times in Romans, once in Galatians, and once here in Ephesians, for those who like to keep count. It's a connotation of legally claiming as a child. Each time it's used, it's almost like there isn't another word with enough weight to describe God's action toward us. There's a specific nuance that this was a relationship God was pleased to establish. We have been adopted with joy and with intentionality, friends. I find it most inspiring that our family of messy and broken people from all walks of life is built on love and love alone. This isn't just obligation to shared names or shared bloodlines. There's no need for rash comments of, well, you have to because they're family. In fact, the early church was often made up of strangers. We're looking up at a huge collection of immigrants and outcasts doing their best to stay under the radar of empire and assimilate in this unrelenting culture so that their lives might be spared. But instead of playing along, 
The God of redemption comes down in a powerful wind to proclaim that this family is in fact for all people. No government or persecution or casting out can take this freedom away from us. No height, nor depth, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. The illegitimacy of these toxic tropes about blending in and just doing what we're told applies to those lies we tell ourselves to. I'm irreparably broken, completely unlovable, entirely alone. Thankfully, the faulty foundation of these lies we've been told by others and the lies we tell ourselves crumble in the sight of God wrapping us up, bringing us in and claiming us now and forever. You are loved, and you are enough. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. We belong in God's family because the Lord God Almighty knew this great family is incomplete without someone just like you. You are desired, selected, favored, set apart. This language is vital to understanding the grace of our relationship with our creator and the power it gives us to bring the kingdom of heaven just a little bit closer here and now. This is my understanding of the complicated Presbyterian concept of predestination. Not that we are golden children who sit back and don't have any contribution to make. But rather, all of God's people are chosen so that we can participate in the mission of God in this world as we wait for what's to come. And this mission, friends, is so important. So important. Katie and I have this habit when we get really excited about having kids and then we remember we've only been married for two and a half years, so maybe this is not the right next step for us. We love to look at profiles of children waiting for adoption online. There are adorable pictures of these kids and a robust paragraph about their passions and interests. One of my personal favorites is this kid whose only goals in life are to get straight A's and be a race car driver. (laughs) But it's really the second paragraph that gets me. The last paragraph on these profiles describes what a child is looking for in their adoptive family. Some want a dog or prefer a big yard or want older siblings. But without fail, Every single one of these children is looking for stability and love. Every single one. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's really all any of us wants. I hear it in the conversations I have with B and that frustration of celebrating good work and trying to do good work with therapists. I certainly felt it in my held breath and tense shoulders that creep in when I'm down, discouraged, or flat out overwhelmed. Maybe you recognize this desire in yourself, too. Incredibly and thankfully, we find stability and love in Christ, the solid rock on which we stand. And because this love is unconditional, unrelenting, and unwavering, we are empowered to proclaim love and justice for all. In every language, every nation, every tongue, for men and women and folks who don't fit into binary categories, no matter what you've done or left undone, Love and justice are ours and our neighbors 
because of who God is and just how much God loves us. Rest assured today and every day that our love and identity is secured in the everlasting God who designed creation so that we might not be alone. Through the Holy Spirit, we have been adopted, friends. And our work to share this good news across the globe, redemption and reconciliation is just starting. May we live, serve, and love with the truth in mind that we have been gifted a holy and beloved adoption, belonging to Christ now and forever. Good. It's now time for prayers with people. God, as we take this journey, sorry, I got teared up during the talk. Sorry. God, as we take this journey that draws us even closer to you, walk with us, sustain us, and nurture us. As we walk through the potholes of life, the valleys and the pits of life, guide us with your hand. Keep our, feet stir- keep our feet steady and our vision on you. Whether we choose to give something for Lent or do something positive, let us not do it out of obligation or the tyranny of oughtness, but out of love for you. Keep us in your paths of love, mercy, and grace. Help us to remember we are not alone, but that we are walking with our fellow travelers. Amen. At this time, we invite you to share, either silently or aloud, the names of those that the Spirit has put in your heart and mind this morning. Let us now sing the prayer that Jesus taught us. Friends, out of gratitude for all that we have been provided, we continue in our worship this morning by sharing our gifts, tithes, and offerings. 
If you consider Newport your church home, we invite you to share an offering. If you are visiting us today, please do not feel obligated to give as you are our guests. Ushers, please come forward. Giving is not a casual act. It relates God's work to our work. Peter writes, as each has received a gift, employ it for one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. We give as people whose work is inextricably linked to God's, work, to God's great works of creation, redemption, and empowerment. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to come to the table, I want to remind our friends who are online, if you want to grab some communion elements for yourself, some cracker and juice, or maybe coffee and a donut. Um, anything that helps you join in this table fellowship that we are all going to have both in person and virtually. This is a table that reminds us of this incredible grace that Pastor Kelly reminded us of in her lovely sermon, that we are adopted and here is a place where we can all come together to be reminded not only that we belong, but that we are loved in that belonging. Let us pray. <clears throat> Oh God, just as you have walked with so many throughout the ages, through their wilderness times, through their difficult times, as well as their joyful times, you are here with us this day as well. We are grateful for the way that you have always taken care of us, the way you have always shown up in ways that are remarkable and in ways that sometimes really take so much work on our, ha our behalf to notice. We pray that you will continue to walk alongside of us. We pray that we will be a people who recognize you just as the disciples did when your, the risen Lord broke bread and gave it to them and they opened their eyes and saw who they really were with. Lord, may it be the same for us. May we, in sharing of this simple meal here around this table and with our friends online, have our eyes opened, our hearts softened to recognize you in our midst and the way that you are working in and through each person gathered. 
We give you thanks, O oh God, for the promises fulfilled and the promises yet to come. Amen. Friends, this table has been set before for everyone. Whether you are someone who has had communion a million times, or this is the first time that you dare to come to the table. Whether you're someone who totally has their act together and their faith is strong, or you're that person who sits with a million questions, this is your table. This is a place where people from east and west and north and south are gathered and told, you count, you belong, you are important, and you are part of us. And this is why we take this bread and this fruit of the vine. Let us remember how this all began. On the night that Jesus was arrested and betrayed and denied, that same night he invited all of his friends to have one last meal with him. And during that meal, he took bread and he gave thanks for it. He blessed it and then he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In a very similar way, when they had finished eating, he turned to his disciples and he poured out the fruit of the vine. And he said, friends, this is the cup of salvation that has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. For every time that you eat from this bread and drink from this cup, you are proclaiming not only the forgiveness of sins, but the fact that I will return. That's why we say that these are the gifts of God for the people of God. There is no one barred from this table. No one can be denied access to the Lord. All you need to do is desire to draw near. I'd like to invite our communion servers to come forward to distribute the elements.
Holy One, we are so grateful that you are mindful of us, that you feed us, that you nurture us, that you care so much for us, that your love knows no bounds, and that it is extravagant beyond measure. We are grateful for your grace as well that knows that despite our blemishes and our brokenness, we are beloved and we belong to you. We pray that the meal that we have shared will not only draw us closer to you and strengthen us, but will also draw us to one another, your beloved community, that we may be the reflection of your mercy and, that your, and your love for all of humanity, for all of your people. May this meal now empower us to be your representatives, to be your disciples here on earth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a question. Uh, is this the kind of day that when you leave here, you might feel like going out to enjoy? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I tell you what, uh, for this last song, why don't you stand if you're able and we'll sing. We will go out with joy. Friends, we have been gifted an adoption that empowers us to share love and justice and grace with the whole world. As we go out from this place, slash staying here for a moment for a meeting, <laughs> know that Christ goes before you to plan and prepare your way. The Holy Spirit walks beside you as friend and companion for the journey. And most importantly, the God of redemption persists above you, calling and reconciling your life now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.